Hi everyone, I'm Lorian Lawrence, the author of the spooky middle grade series called Fright Watch, which is out in August from Abrams Amulet. And I am with these lovely authors who are going to talk to you about all things villains. So let's get it started and go to Chris first. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Chris Negron and my book is Dan Unmasked, which is sort of a middle grade about uh, um, baseball and comic books. It's about uh, a boy named Dan, of course, who is um, has a friend who has a baseball accident and falls into a coma. And because Dan feels like he might be responsible for the accident, he assigns himself the task of trying to find a way to wake his friend up. And along the way, he finds out a whole bunch of stuff about his family and his friendships and his teammates and himself, and including that maybe it's not just uh, superpowers that make someone a superhero. And last thing is it comes out on July 28th. Hi, I'm Ashvan Otterloo. Um, my book is Caddy Wampus, um, and it comes out in August. Um, it's a story about two girls who are from rival witch families who have both been forbidden from doing magic because their families have mutually agreed magic is a bad thing, it's hurting the community and we're fighting too much. But they go and do magic on the down low when they find the grimoire that belongs to Delphi, the main character's mom. Um, and they accidentally resurrect a whole entire graveyard of zombified ancestors that are from their families. So they have to figure out a way to work together so that they can undo the curse and the whole community doesn't get torn apart by the spell that they did. Hey everyone, um, I'm so excited about all of your books and to talk about villains with you all today. My name is Reese Eshman and I'm the author of Edda Invincible, which is a middle grade contemporary fantasy coming out on May 11th, 2021. It's the story of two new friends who've connected through their love of comics who find a magical train in their neighborhood in Chicago. But they discover that the train's magic is malfunctioning and spreading fear around the city. In order to save their families and the city, they'll have to solve puzzles, fight a supervillain, and face their own fears to stop and fix the train. Hi everyone, my name is Deka Herman and I'm the author of Hide and Seeker. And it's about a group of kids who attend the welcome home party for their friend who mysteriously disappeared and then reappeared a year later. And during the uh, party, they decide to play a game of hide and seek that ends a little violently. And the next day they wake up to learn that a kid disappeared and then another kid disappears and then another kid disappears and they realize they're being hunted by something or someone, and they have to figure out what it is before they all disappear. And it's out in September. I'm so excited for that, Deka. I'm both excited and terrified based on your cover. <laughs> uh, I'm Christina Suntornba, and I'm the author of A Wish in the Dark. This is a fantasy novel, and it is about a boy who escapes from prison where he was living. And he is on the run, and the prison warden's daughter is intent on catching him and returning him to the prison. Um, so we're going to be talking about villains today. Uh, this prison warden's daughter, I think she starts off as the villain, but um, I won't tell you what happens, but it doesn't, doesn't quite stay that way. It has some villain switching going on in the book. Hey guys, um, my name is Melissa Hope, and I wrote a book called Sea of Kings. It's a swashbuckling tale of two brothers who are on a mission to rescue their island from pirates. And very quickly, they have to uh, get off the island, and they're only armed with a stolen ship, a mixed match crew, and a magical map that they don't understand and they'll have to set sail for help, only to discover how deadly the seas can be. They'll have to decode the map, fight some gnarly sea monsters, and confront the evil one-eyed pirate, or lose their home forever. And that comes out in April 2021 with Jollyfish Press. 
All of these books sound so amazing. I'm also a seventh grade middle school English teacher and I'm always looking for books that are going to grab my kids' attention and I can't wait to buy all of these ones for my room. So speaking of grabbing kids' attention, every student I've ever taught is really, really interested in what makes a villain tick. So I would love for you guys to take a minute and talk about what makes an absolutely, truly delicious, terrifying villain. In order, Chris, Ash, Reese, Deka, Christina, and Melissa. All right, I had to unmute. Um, okay, yeah, and I'm just going to repeat the question a little bit because uh, it was cut out a little bit, but you're asking about what makes a villain delicious. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think for me, um, I don't write like some of the things that I heard, some of the fabulous books I heard about like horror and things like that. So um, I write more of like a heartfelt thing. So for me, the villain is a lot about um, sort of the hero in the way that, um, you know, often the villain in at least in my stories is like either like a dark mirror or like an opposite for the hero and the hero's like interaction or relationship with the villain is often what leads to the transformation of the hero so um i guess you know for me lots of times the heart of the story comes out through who the villain is and what what their relationship to the type of person or character or creature or whatever that the, the hero is. So um, I think for me, that's always what makes it so interesting to read villains is how they relate to the heroes. So I think my favorite thing about a really great villain, what makes one juicy and just compelling is one, they want the same thing that we want, which is for the story to be interesting. Um, because if we are reading about, you know, someone getting up in the morning and having the best day ever and then going to bed the end we would be bored to tears um so like a really great villain in my mind is one that either is the complete opposite of the hero and we don't understand what motivates them and they're kind of an immovable force and we're wondering is the hero going to be able to stand up to this or one that is similar to the hero um and shows like maybe the dark side of what you could be as the hero's journey. Um, so if I see a little bit of myself in a villain, sometimes that can be really good because it makes me think, mm, how am I gonna overcome this in my own life? So these are these are my favorite villains. I love what both Chris and Ash were saying about villains who are complete opposites or reflections of what's going on with your main character. I think that's what I love about middle grade specifically is that you don't always need this big, super bad alien guy. Sometimes the villains I love the most are the ones whose experiences are parallel to the hero's internal journey or maybe even our own internal journeys, like what Ash was saying about loving villains that we can relate to in some way. I love villains who are reflections of our main character's insecurities, fears, or desires, like the other mother in Coraline where you're seeing this other perfect version of your life and you have to figure out what it is you want and what it is that's worth fighting for. So I think my favorite favorite villains are the ones whose stories are closely related to the hero's emotional journey. And just to kind of piggyback off what Chris, Ash, and Reese said, um, I think the best villains for me are the ones I have a, a truly emotional response to. Like, I love to hate them. But they're they're clever, they're complicated, they're a little bit relatable, and maybe even a little bit sympathetic. And they actually make me think. So if I was given the same choices or in the same circumstances, would I make those same choices? And so I'm so they make me sort of conflicted. Like I know what they're doing is wrong, but I also a little bit understand their motivation of why they're doing it. So I think for me, the best villains are the ones, again, that are just complex characters that I can in some way relate to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, um, Ash, when you said either a villain can be different from the hero or really similar, to me, the villains that I 
just really gravitate towards and become so um, enthralled with are when the villain and the hero have something that ties them really closely together. Like they share something in common. Like I'm thinking of Kylo Ren and Rey and how they are so, there's so much there that connects them. And she's so um, drawn to him and almost comes over to his side many times because of how much they have in common. In A Wish in the Dark, the villain and and my main character, they both want exactly the same thing. Like they're both going towards these goals, but they just, they have different ways of approaching it. And that's the only thing that divides them from being the hero or the villain is like what they're willing to do to get what they want. So so that's what, I, I love the, the pull, the push pull between the hero and the villain where you really don't know what might happen with them. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome, Christina. Um, I, I don't know, like I missed the last one. So I feel like I agree with everything you guys say, but I think I'll also add that um, I really find a villain interesting to read about when I understand that they have a motive and I like really know what that motive is because a villain is someone that doesn't think they're the villain. I think they think they're the hero of their own story. So you know, like nobody's bad just to be bad. So like the motive, it usually comes from, uh, it stems from a bad experience that happened to a regular character. So learning more about that really makes them interesting. I guess we were mentioning Star Wars. So um, Anakin or Darth Vader, we get to see like, we, we, we meet Darth Vader, but then later on we get to learn how he became Darth Vader and just that what motivated him to turn dark was actually love. And it, you know, he just, every time he felt like that love was gonna be threatened, like his love for Padme, I hope I'm not being too nerdy right now. Um, but, you know, like his love for Padme and, and he, he wanted to make sure that she wouldn't die like his mother did every time he felt like someone was threatening that love that pushed him further to like the dark side so i think that's what made him so interesting to me and what makes other villains so interesting is when i know their motive and they're just more more human to me all great and really interesting answers i would like you to take it a step further now i mean star wars was brought up a few times I want to know what is your fascination with villain, villains? What is our fascination as a society with villains? You guys brought up Vader. He represents pure evil, right? Yet he has a massive following and like millions of fans. So what is it about villains that draws us in? Chris? Right, so I guess I'll start again. Yeah, so, so what is it about villains that we're so fascinated with in popular culture. We were mentioning um, the Star Wars villains. And for me, like, I'm a huge fan of Star Wars too, but I'm, I'm as you might see in Dan Unmasked with the, the cover with the comic book, I'm also a, a giant comic book fan. And so like, for example, in comic books, I think my favorite villain is the Doctor Doom from Fantastic Four. And I think for him and also for Darth Vader, they're sort of similar. I think with the villains, you can sort of hide more, like you hide more of the motives. They're a lot of times they're masks, like both those characters have these masks and what's behind the mask. And, you know, in fact, I didn't think about it. Until I started answering this, but they're both kind of disfigured and, and that kind of thing. So I think it's just um, we're fascinated with the idea that um, these people have more secrets. You know, usually in our stories, as we're following the hero, the hero often has secrets, too. But Part of the, the objective of a writer is we, we're sort of letting you know who the hero is slowly but surely as we tell the story. But a lot of times in those stories, the villains, they stay pretty hidden until maybe the end. And so I think we just we just like to, to follow those kind of characters because they, they stay behind the scenes or they stay behind their masks for longer than our heroes do. So I think that's that would be my answer. But it's an interesting question for sure. So I'm going to be super basic and say that my favorite villain probably of all time is Loki um, from the Thor franchise, which is like a really basic answer, I guess, because Tom Hiddleston is great. Um, but I think my my favorite thing about what it makes the villain really compelling um, is that usually when 
a character starts a journey, like they, there's like a status quo that's going on. That's, um, it's okay. But I think that most of us, especially um, children, have a desire to ask questions about the status quo, like the world around us, um, the kingdoms around us. We might have questions that we're afraid to ask because it's disruptive to ask them right? But the villain's not afraid to do that. There's like, there's always a seed or a vein of truth in the villain. And they're going to call out, like in the story where the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> um, if you're unfamiliar with that, if you're kid watching, you can ask your teacher, that would be a cool thing to talk about. Um, but the villain is often the one who's able to speak the truth about the society or the world or the systems around them, that the main character might be a little bit too afraid to do because it would be really disruptive. Um, and also I think a really great villain is, it, it doesn't want the story to end. We wanna know more about things. I was always curious as a kid about the questions I wasn't allowed to ask because I think as kids, we have a good sense of what's taboo, what isn't, and a natural curiosity to wanna know about things that are taboo or things that are a little darker, or things that we feel like maybe we're not getting the whole story. And the villain is always like grabbing the corner and peeling it back and saying, hey, I'll tell you, this is what's kind of also going on in this world that might not be so great. Um, so that's that's why I love a good villain. I love that, Ash. And I love what Melissa said, too, about how the villain is the hero of their own story. When you reach that moment in a book or a movie where you understand how the villain ended up where they are, what their goal is, and why they think they're the hero, that's the coolest moment for me. It makes them so intriguing as I'm trying to figure out their motivations and mistakes and how their choices put them on this path that they're on. So often villains are driven by something that's relatable in some way, like feeling that they don't fit in or thinking that if only someone gave them them all the power they could somehow fix the whole universe like ash said they're demanding answers to the big questions we have about the world and it's okay for us to do the same while also recognizing that their choices were wrong and seeing the difference between how a hero solves problems and how a villain solves problems i think villains are also so fascinating because they can be unpredictable they aren't thinking about things the way the hero is they often aren't thinking about anyone but themselves so sometimes their actions surprise us like when a villain suddenly decides to help the hero or abandon their own plan I try so hard to understand other people, so when I encounter a character who does something I completely didn't expect, I am so hooked because I just need to see what's going to happen next. Um, for me, I think what makes them compelling is that they do things, they do bad things that we can't do that they're relatable in a way that sometimes they're more relatable than heroes because none of us are perfect. And then we have these bad guys in front of us who are doing all the things or having these emotions that we've been told are bad and are bad, but they get away with it in some way. And so we can relate and seeing them do the things that we shouldn't want to do or we shouldn't be doing it, but they are sort of acting it out before us. And I think for me also, it's, I think the, the best villains have the best backstories. And I'm always interested in what made them that way. Why are they doing the things? What what motivated them? Because I think for us also, we all come from like good and bad things that happen that affect us in some way, but we don't ever take it to that next level. So we relate to them and it's like, that could be me on some level, not magnified to what we see and the different movies or shows, I was thinking um, about Killmonger from Black Panther and what made him become who he was. And it's a family drama of wanting revenge of something he was wronged in some kind of way. And that played out to the level that he became this bad guy and how we are always sort of on that edge of what we could turn into. So I think for me, they're compelling because in some ways they reflect us but at a different level. And we wanna understand why people do bad things, like what makes that happen. So that's why they're compelling to me. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Deka. Um, I, I think that when you're a writer and you're writing the villain, you have to 
even if you disagree with your villain, you have to have compassion for your villain. You have to see it from their eyes because in the end you want your reader to exactly what you were saying, uh, Deka, be able to see if I had just made some different choices, if I had just had some different life circumstances, or you know, I could be doing that too. Like there, there's a part of me in that villain. Um, I, my family has been watching Hamilton uh, uh, like on repeat, the Hamilton musical. And for every, every anything, whatever you think about Hamilton, the the way that uh, Lin Manuel Miranda wrote Aaron Burr's uh, character. Who who would ever know about Aaron Burr or like would you ever want to like read or about Aaron Burr? Nobody would ever know about him if if he hadn't been presented in this way. And you you see um, you know how he's interpreting every scene. And there's so much that re is relatable there about you know jealousy and ambition and fear and you know being self conscious. Um, so I, I when we're talking about like villains in popular culture, that is one that is I think is so well done that you would feel compassion for Aaron Burr, who I think you probably never would give two thoughts to before that before the musical. Okay, I think I need to watch Hamilton now. <laughs> um, yeah, I just echoing what everyone's been saying. Um, I think we're fascinated by villains because they get to do what we we don't get to do. We, like they're unconstrained by rules and regulations. They get to go wild and, and it's like liberating and we can live vi vicariously through them. But, you know, we don't usually go to the extent that they do because because we're taught by society not to and we're we're good people. So there's definitely that um that part of us that could be uh, like like a tiny bit like the villain, and we we kind of like lean into that, I think, and enjoy watching it, even though we wouldn't go that far ourselves. <laughs> Does that make sense? I hope so. Hopefully, we won't go that into that far into the dark side ourselves. But I'm curious. There's so many different kinds of villainy. So. Are you more interested in exploring supernatural villains like monsters, things that don't really exist? Or are you more interested in exploring the human kind? We'll go with Chris. Sure. Yeah, so um, for me, I mean, I guess if I had to choose between those two, I would say supernatural, but I think I'm actually gonna go back to one of my earlier answers and also some things that folks have been saying in some of the other answers and say, what I really like to write is like the dark mirror type of villain. So as was, I think, I think Deka maybe said it and Christina about, you know, villains that had, you know, were similar to the heroes or had some, you know, just made different choices and that kind of thing. I think um, like with Dr. Doom, as I mentioned, you know, with the Fantastic Four, I mean, both he and Reed Richards were like, you know, at the same college learning the same things, they just went in different directions. And also like in Dan Unmasked, um, there's a comic book inside of my book. So I created, the kids, it's a it's a contemporary fiction book, but then there's a comic book inside. And I can't say too much about the villain in the comic book, but it's it's the they're called the Nexus Five, the team, and the, the villain is called the Hollow. And he's kind of a supernatural, but he's very much like a dark mirror for a lot of things that are going on. And I, I can't spoil it, but I just know that that's how, that's what I like to write is when you know the kid the villain is got the, almost the same characteristics as the hero and just either makes a different choice or, or uses the powers in a different way. Like Batman and Scarecrow, you know, Batman uses fear as a weapon, but also Scarecrow uses fear. Like that's, if they give me, you know, Batman to write, which, you know, <laughs> cross my fingers, um, I would probably do like a big Scarecrow storyline because I just think that's so interesting the way they use the same thing for different purposes. So, since I was a really small kid, um, I've always loved playing games um, against myself. <laughs> it's it's my favorite way to compete, to see if I can not necessarily compete against other people, but constantly be playing a game against myself is fun for me. Maybe I was a little introverted. Um, and I think that my favorite kind of villains probably reflect that a little bit. Um, some like, 
some characters and some people tend to be like really precocious and maybe impulsive. And there's a lot of like, instead of ready, aim, fire, it's ready, fire, aim, right? Oh no, I shouldn't have done that. Um, so I think that my favorite villain is when somebody makes a mess themselves and then they have to like kind of duke it out with their own, uh, the, the own chaos that they created. Um, because I think in real life, often for me, it's some of the scariest, some of the scariest um, bad guys that I could go up against would be like a really big mistake that I had made. Because um, everybody can relate to that idea of that moment where you know you've gone a step too far. You're talking to your mom and you say something and you can't take that back and you are in so much trouble. It's that moment of no return. Um, and it's like, ah, I can't put this back in the bottle. I can't fix this. I can't undo this. The only way out is through. Um, so I guess Caddy Wampus reflects that a little bit. Um, the idea that there's a lot of unresolved issues in her family, um, maybe her parents and their parents and the rest of her ancestors didn't deal with a lot of things. They just let them be buried. Um, so in a lot of ways, Delpha and Ketebird are repeating the same cycle that they did because no one learned how to do different. They just learned how to bury it. So it's very much a mess that they created themselves. And the only way out is through. You have to figure out how to untangle what you did. Um, and that's my favorite because oftentimes we're, we're the, our own most formidable enemy. <laughs> I agree completely with both Chris and Ash. Chris, I think our books probably have some cool similarities, which makes me extra excited for Dan Unmasked. There are some comic books and Edda Invincible as well, and the supervillain that my main character ends up facing is the one that she created herself. And so like what you were saying, Ash, she's having to fight the physical manifestation of her own fears and projections and mistakes. And so it's like in a monster calls when the monster says, you know, you called me, I showed up here because of you, because of something that you need or that you're afraid of. And I love that so much in middle grade when you end up coming against something that came from inside your own brain. I also love, and I think Christina, you were talking about this, that villain switch. That's my favorite too, when there's a villain who has potential to make that switch to the hero's side. They're usually insecure or you just want so badly for them to find that good inside themselves, like Zuko and Avatar or Ash, you talked about Loki as well. So sometimes they do make the right choice and sometimes they keep going down this villainous path. Um, but whenever I feel that potential that they just could change, I find that really extra compelling. I think for me in Hide and Seeker, I realized that there are there's a human villain and there's a supernatural villain. Um, I tend to lean towards writing supernatural villains. Um, I was always, I am always, like Star Wars, um, Marvel, big fans of fantasy. And I can create, I think, more distance with the supernatural villain, the human. And I think for both my villains and heroes, there are, um, there's a little bit of me in each of those characters. And it almost feels less personal if it's a supernatural villain versus a human villain. So I tend to gravitate more towards supernatural. Plus, I like the fantasy of it all, the creating the world, giving the character these special abilities. So and having them having to fight against other characters using those special abilities when they're good or they're evil. So I tend to like supernatural, even if I think about some of my the villains that I enjoy more. I don't know if anyone was a big like Buffy the Vampire person, but Spike and Drusilla and, and like, you know, I, for Marvel, Thanos, like they're all in some kind of way, um, the yellow eyes from the show Supernatural. It's always the supernatural villains that I gravitate towards. And those are the ones I usually tend to write. And I think it's because I can, I have more distance. It seems almost less personal to me to reflect myself in these characters if they're supernatural. I don't know why, but that's me. I love supernatural. I usually write fantasy. So usually my villains have some sort of supernatural power. So in A Wish in the Dark, uh, the, the biggest villain is a governor and he has the ability to create light. He has this magical ability um, and he, 
does not create it equally for everyone. So it's really, he has supernatural powers, but what makes him a villain, the, his villainous nature is his human side. So it's it's all of those human choices uh, that that make him so so cruel. It's his cruelty that uh, that makes him the villain. So if I had to choose, I would say a supernatural villain with human tendencies. <laughs> Um, I think the more evil they can be, the more fun they are to write. I, I usually write fantasy. So um, like in my book, Sea of Kings, I have a, some a villain that has some powers. But uh, another thing I love to write about is villains that blur the lines of evil. So for example, in my own book, I, I have this villain, but then towards the end, you realize that there may have been someone else that was worse this whole time. And I just, I really like turning, like putting that twist at the end. I think those are fun to write about too. Thank you. All of that was so interesting. I would like to explore this a little further, this idea of villains in the real world. So if we can go into what villains can teach us about ourselves and about the world around us, I'm going to switch the order and start with Melissa first. Okay, uh, so what villains teach us about the world, <clears throat> um, I think that Villains teach us that, for me at least, that there's justice in the world because I think it's important to point out that a villain's power in literature, a villain's power or strength is like always the cause of that, their downfall. And it's the hero who plays a role in this, rather directly or indirectly. So I was like really, really um, happy to be able to do this in my own book where my villain, um, my villain's power and strength is the downfall of them. But <clears throat> another example that you guys would actually know <laughs> is uh, the Lion King. So, so there's Scar and he has his, his power and his strength comes from the support of the hyenas. And then the hyenas are really what kills him in the end. And it was Simba who played a direct role in causing the hyenas to turn on Scar. So that, so that I know like the world isn't perfect, but I do feel like it teaches us that there is justice and that there is a consequence for doing these bad things. And the more bad we do, the more likely it is that the bad thing will bring about our downfall. So like, um, like even just a simple lie, I think we, we can see from literature that saying a lie is it's not it's going to like bring about more problems and and uh, not bring about our downfall necessarily, but it's going to make life harder, especially the more lies we tell. So I hope that made sense. Yeah, totally did. Um, so when I've been talking to kids about a wish in the dark, and we're talking about the governor um, and and what makes him a villain, we talk a lot about uh, how cruel cruel people often have not they don't have bad intentions. They or they convince themselves that they have good intentions. So now I can't remember who said this. I think it was Melissa who said they're the hero of their own story. So. The governor in A Wish in the Dark, he has created these laws that that do things like keep children in a prison. When when we start off in the book, the, the hero in the book is in prison. Um, he has very good intentions for doing that. He has reasons uh, that he really, really believes in. So when when I'm talking to kids about this, you know, we talk a lot about the real world and talk about how cruelty is all often justified you know you're gonna find um situations adults um there's gonna be laws there's gonna be policies that where you know someone is going to lay out very um logical rules for why 
it, they um, have a right to be cruel to other people. And so, you know, it's up to us, it's up to the heroes, because we are the heroes, the kids are the heroes, to pull back and to say, there's never um, a justification for cruelty. Like, you know, Thanos, he had totally logical reason for what he was trying to do uh, in those movies, but that's not a justification for for his cruelty, right? So that's that's one thing I think they can teach us. I've been really thinking about this one and, and just in my story and for the human character, something bad happened and he had to make a decision and it was a really bad decision and it's a decision that he can't take back. And that sort of led him on this path of villainy. And I think um, for us, it's the same one mistake. We all have these moments where we can sort of drift off into villainy, I think. One mistake, one bad thing happened and it all depends on how we react to that. And I think it makes us sort of take a step back and look at the villains that are people we have determined are villains and maybe think about what we do in our lives. Because again, like I think someone mentioned like lying or being mean to someone, all of those things can actually build up to take you to a different level of being a bad person. And what are we learning for that? So I think villains maybe teach us how to think about the choices we make. And are we, there's a thin line between sometimes I think being the villain and being the hero. And what does it take to cross that line? What choices do we make? And how do we make different choices? And what are the choices we wanna make? And I'm not sure if I'm actually answering that question, <laughs> but I, I think that they teach us to sort of think about our lives and what we're doing and how we respond to different things and how, again, one mistake could change everything in our lives as well. So it kind of makes us question our, our lives in some respect. I'm not sure that answered it, but <laughs> that's my thought. I love that, Deka, that villains make us think about our own choices and ask the big questions like, what happens when I stop empathizing with other people or stop thinking about how my actions might be hurting others? And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about supernatural villains or human villains, we can see a reflection of the injustice in our own world in all of those stories. There might not be, you know, a Sith Lord invading your middle school, but there will be other things that we recognize as wrong and we have to figure out how we're going to respond to those things. Things. You know, do I freeze? Do I get help? Do I find a way to fight this? And we're all going to go through hardships both in our everyday lives and when we encounter something that seems bigger than what we know of the world so far. So we'll have to think about our choices and how they can lead us down the path of the villain or the bystander or the hero. Um, I think I'm just going to agree with everything that Deka and Risi said. Um, I think that sometimes it's very easy. If, if you're naturally compassionate or empathetic as a person, um, it can be very easy to, to see all sides of things, right? Um, so you might be able to look at someone who's a villain and say, well, I understand why they did that. It doesn't make it right, but you understand why they did that. And I think that being able to watch their arc from beginning to end and say, and if you do this, this is the natural outcome of what happens when somebody does this. It can make it really, it's a really useful tool because then you can get really super clear on why you think something is wrong and why you think something is right and your own values kind of get um, crystal clear to you. It's like a way of exploring them and knowing where the line is. And even if I had compassion on somebody for making that decision, maybe it's okay for me to say, yeah, and what you did is wrong, to find your, uh, your judgment sea legs a little bit. Because it's not always a bad thing to be judicious and to look at someone and say, yeah, that was wrong what you did. That's not a good thing. Um, so yeah, that's that's mostly what I have to say about it. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I mean, mostly I could say ditto. I mean, I think I, I would just say, 
just the same answer in a little bit different way. So a lot of the answers were, were, were talking about different choices that you can make as a villain and so forth. And there were some comments about distance. And I would just say, I think that's sort of the point of like stories themselves, right? Like as writers, we read a lot of these, um, we call them craft books where you, where you learn about writing and you try to figure out how to do this thing. And one of the ones I, I like is called Story Genius. And in there, they talk about cave drawings and they kind of say, oh, those are the first stories. And what was the point of the story, right? So someone gets attacked by a saber tooth or whatever, and then they go back to the cave and they draw the saber tooth and they show that if you go out there and go near this animal, you'll get attacked, right? So it's a story that gives sort of a, you know, a lesson, don't, don't do that, right? So in the same way, this, this comment about different choices and so forth, I mean, that's kind of the, the point of, of stories and specifically villains maybe in stories sometimes, it's just to show, you know, how different it can be if you just make one simple wrong choice or that kind of thing. So um, I think that's probably the, the lesson that, uh, that villains can teach us, which is basically the same, everybody said, except in a different way. Thank you. This has been such a fun conversation. We have about five minutes left. I'd like to do a lightning round with one last question. And that is what advice do you have for kids who encounter real life villains? So try and keep it like your one favorite piece of advice to give. And we'll start with Melissa again. Okay, uh, lightning. Um, every villain that you encounter is just a person like you who's made a bad choice. And a lot of the times the bad choice is nothing to do with you. So I think responding with love may often help the villain realize that they would rather be the hero instead. Um, I'm gonna say, I haven't read everybody's books, but I'm gonna suspect that all of our books, our hero has a crew has somebody to lean on. There is so rarely do you have a hero who defeats a villain all by themselves. So I would say, you know, find your crew, find your superhero team, and that might be your friend. It might be, a, you know, um, an online friend. It might be um, your teacher, your parents, somebody that you can rely on, that you can talk to, and that you can go forward and, and battle this villain with. I'm going to echo what Christina said that yes, having your crew and knowing that it's okay to stand up for what's right and stand up for others. And it may be a little scary sometimes, but just keep believing in yourself and keep trying because everyone has some hero aspect. They can be their own hero. I agree that our teachers, friends, and guardians may not look like heroes or sidekicks, but that doesn't mean they can't be there for us when we're facing something difficult. There are so many superheroes who say they prefer to work alone, but they always end up needing help from the people that love them. And I would also want kids to know that having superpowers or being invincible isn't always the most important thing, but we become heroes when we're face to face with a villain and we continue to choose hope and fight for the things we believe in. Um, I, w I would say that if you're coming up against someone who's actually really hurting you, it's important to know it's not your fault. Um, number two, I'm going to echo what everybody else says, find people who can help you. Even if you don't have like a big natural crew, or if you're new somewhere, there are people who want to help you who are safe people. So stand up, find your power, know that you can do hard things. Um, but also don't be afraid to let other people help you. It still counts. Yeah, so um, pretty much everybody <laughs> stole the same answer that that I had to this one, which is if you're struggling with something, and I guess I'll make it specific to, to boys if I can, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with being vulnerable. So if you're struggling with something and don't think that you can't go and talk to adults, as Reese said, the people around you, that's actually a big lesson in, in Dan Unmasked is, uh, you know, the adults around you have more uh, powers than you think they do. Thank you so much, everybody, for spending this time with me to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is villains, and also to give some advice as to what kids can do if they meet a villain in real life. With that, I hope, dear viewer, that you check out all of these amazing books. They will be linked for you, and we'll see you soon. Bye.